Artificial ski slopes are a key feature of the skiing scene in Scotland. During the past 25 years or so, the growth in the number of artificial ski slopes has been steady, and they've all been successful, almost too successful. Today, almost one in ten of adults ski, a lot of them learning their basic skills on artificial slopes before venturing onto snow. As the number of skiers has risen, so have their expectations, not just of the facilities and coaching standards, but of all of the services provided at artificial slopes and of the snow slopes onto which they hope to progress. The Scottish Sports Council believes that artificial slopes must be carefully planned to provide the right facilities in order to allow the maximum possible development potential, as well as helping relieve pressure on the limited and unpredictable snow slopes. The Council has produced an information digest on artificial ski slopes, a technical document which has generated a lot of interest. We've now asked Sally McNair to look at the facts behind the digest, and here's her report. The boom in artificial ski slope started here at Hill End on the south side of Edinburgh, when a handful of enthusiasts decided to put down an experimental 50 metre slope. That was 25 years ago. Now Hill End is ten times as long, it's the biggest artificial slope in Europe, and last year was used by more than 180,000 skiers. But what exactly should an artificial slope provide? Is it realistic or even possible to cater both for the beginner and the expert? John Arnold is the Director of Coaching for the Scottish National Ski Council. The Ski Council's view or the role of the artificial ski slope is that the, the artificial ski slope brings the skiing to the populated areas of Scotland. It makes the skiing, uh, the sport of skiing more accessible to, the, to people within the populated areas that would otherwise may not even dream of going skiing because it's too far away. This enables more skiers to take up the sport, it enables more people to participate in it and enjoy it, and then possibly continue in, uh, at other facilities on the snow or other dry slope centres. How well can artificial slopes, though, cater for the whole range of, of users, from the complete novice to the real expert? Well, very well, in fact, if certain factors are considered in the design stage of establishing an artificial ski slope. Um, for example, beginners can be catered for on a separate beginner area, uh, a gradual terrain of about 12 degrees that has a flat area at the bottom with a counter slope. Um, then for intermediate skiers, the slope can be slightly wider, uh, anything up to 20 meters. Um, it can be longer, up to 200, 250 meters. Uh, of course, with some form of uplift to, uh, to give them more amount of ski time uh, where changes of terrain um, a slightly steeper slope of 18 degrees which might sound steep but in fact it isn't uh, it isn't too steep um, just enough to gain some momentum and uh, and to make the, the learning environment uh, suitable and then some possibly some more uh, abrupt changes of terrain uh, to the side of the slope um, rolls to simulate mogul skiing uh, and then an area of slope that's appropriate for race training and, and slalom training. There are 23 artificial ski slopes in Scotland, most of them small community runs like this one at Fir Park in Tillicutri. They're designed to teach fundamental skiing skills and simply to give children a feel of what skiing can be like. This one was designed almost five years ago by Central Region's Education Department, but it's proved so successful it now caters for race training as well. The region's outdoor education advisor is Drew Mickey. Uh, quite a few years ago, the director of education was keen that uh, pupils uh, in our authority schools should have the opportunity to participate in countryside sports. Skiing was one of these sports, and in order to uh, do that, we had to construct an artificial ski slope here at Tillicutri. We had a specific idea in mind. We wanted to build a teaching slope. Uh, therefore, we had to get a suitable length, a suitable width, a suitable slope profile and a suitable shape. We wanted to take particular care to make sure that the slope was uniform, that it was fairly even and that the gradient was suitable for the, the type of user, the, the, the beginner. And in order to do that, we had to move a large amount of earth around. 
Uh, when we move earth around, obviously it leads to drainage problems. But the crucial factor was getting the slope profile exactly right for the beginner. So we've had drainage problems which we've managed to solve. We just spent a bit of time working on that, but we feel it was time well spent in order to get the correct surface. Um, we believe it's important that there's a positive transfer from this learning situation onto snow. And most beginners have a problem using a toe for the first time. So we've put in a toe which is the kind of uplift used in most of the Scottish ski centres. Uh, we can almost certainly guarantee that the people who learn to use the uplift here will have no problems when they go to one of the snow resorts. And secondly, the floodlights. Um, there's no doubt that during the school day we don't need to use the floodlights, but much of our income is derived from evening use. Without floodlights, we could not have generated any income. Based on your own experience here at Fair Park, what do you think the future for artificial slopes in Scotland is? Well, given the season with not much snow, I think uh, that unless we develop artificial ski slopes, we're going to create a nation of frustrated skiers. Um, I think uh, there requires to be a network of ski slopes throughout the country. There are gaps in the provision just now. There are gaps in Tayside and in southwest Scotland, and uh, some people just simply don't get access to skiing opportunities. And uh, there needs to be um, a further development of both artificial ski slopes and snow ski centres. Hilland is Europe's largest artificial slope. Hans Kubal is the manager with 25 years experience. He believes the situation of the slope is vital, starting with the underlay. There are various themes, you know, some will use underlay uh, in the form of rubber matting, uh, or some firms provide special underlay. You can lay it on wood if you like, you know, have a wooden platform, you, or you do it on grass, like we do. A problem, the first problem is always think about drainage. That can be a big problem. If you put rubber mats down and you outdoors, the water runs down, it will erode underneath the rubber mat and you find your slope all, all at once is in a heap at the bottom. Right? You have to consider that. If you're using wood, wood can rot. It's harder to ski on, it is not so springy. We're using grass because it's a natural hill. And what we do is we put some netting underneath first, then we lay the mat on top, and the netting allows the grass to go through, and also through the mat. And then we put straining wires down, and tie the matting to the straining wire. But basically the grass holds the matting eventually in position. Having said that, of course, the surface has to be flat. You have to prepare the ground, get all the stones out, any trees growing and so on, you know, you have to get rid of that if it's outdoors. If it's indoors, of course, you have no problem, you know, because you have no drainage problem, no water problem or so on. There must be a lot of upkeep involved. Uh, the general upkeep, uh, the type of matting we're using with us lasts about three to four years. Right? So we have a, a complete turnaround every four years of new matting. The daily upkeep, we replace about 10 to 15 mats a day and mostly where there's the most traffic it's a getting off point of the lift and stopping places at the bottom. What are the various types of matting you can use? Well there's basically two types right if you look at that one here that's called a filament right and if you look very carefully uh, it's like a, a brush you know you could use it brushing your garden it's quite stiff right? and they bent over and there's a wire running in the middle down, right? And then you got that metal frame which is crimped. Can you see that? So it's a loop. It's made in a loop. And you have about, oh, uh, I think it's about 240 filaments put to the square inch, compressed together by a machine. The other type, of course, is that, which is injection molded, right? And as you can see, uh, it's just a plastic and that, of course, is just plastic molded on with a base. Now, they are used quite a lot, much cheaper, much, much cheaper, but doesn't last so long. I mean, if I put that on, that won't last three months. But for, for a small slope, like a beginner slope and so on, it probably would be quite good. For our big slope, it wouldn't be good, you know, because I would have a replacement cycle of every three months, replacing the whole slope. Is the most durable mat necessarily the best one for the skier? If you think, you ski before yourself, right? Now, uh, when you ski, in order to control the skis, what you're using? Your edges, right? It's very difficult to get an edge on here, edge control. It's much easier on here, can you see that? 
So not only the deer is lasts longer, it actually better for skiers because it's nearer to snow. You know, it's a better simulator than that one. What about safety? If one of the sections of matting comes away, doesn't that pose a danger to any skier falling over on it? We have special wires with loops and uh, every end has to be tied down and we do a daily inspection of the joints and anything which sticks up and has to be tied down and in the morning from eight o'clock to half past nine before we open all the main there's lift maintenance and she do all the slope maintenance Ideal slope is only part of the story. Maintenance and management of the slope and ancillary buildings is vital too. Hans Kubal again. You must remember if you're the longer the slope, the faster they go, so you can run off the slope. So make sure when you build the slope, you've got plenty of space on either side. If you get snow like we do here, you know, then it becomes even more dangerous and you must make sure all the countryside right within the uh, vicinity of the slope must be cleared of stones, rocks, trees etc. Uh, the problem is the sole. Uh, you can get a pair of skis which last for three weeks and you have to resole them and you can get a pair of skis which only last a day. So you have to be careful what you're buying. That's one problem. The next problem is of course because the friction is so high and you ha you're really on a dusty surface, you know, there's always wind blowing and so on. Uh, the safety mechanism has to be cleaned and oiled every day, otherwise you are unsafe. And perhaps the third, coping, you know, with constantly replacing skis, which is quite an expensive item. Some skis are finished with us after three months. And with the amount of manpower you need, what sort of specific problems does that make? We have uh, a total staff, excluding me, of 33 full-timers of which six are instructors, one senior instructor, um, a manageress, assistant manageress, and uh, office staff and so on. But the main work is done by the ski instructors and the 12 ski centre assistants and the three engineers. And they work in shifts, they four days on, three days off, four days on, three days off. And they do all the maintenance. And they rotate from manning the chair to going on to the uh, higher and so on. They do a morning, afternoon and an evening, so they're doing it in three shifts. What are the problems of maintaining a slope like Hill End? There are quite a lot of problems. Uh, if you have as many skiers as two and a half thousand to three thousand a day, we have to do maintenance twice a day. Which means one of my attendants has to walk down, physically walk down, both slopes with wire, pliers and any end sticking up he has to tie down. Any map which is uh, sort of damaged has to be replaced. So we, in the busy period, we have to do that twice a day, sometimes three times a day. And it's quite a problem when you still have skiers running up and down, passing, buzzing by you, you know. Where do you generate the most profit? Probably in the higher and in the uh, ski school. Not so much on the uplift, because uplift is the dearest item and needs most maintenance. So if you want to be profitable, go for ski school and ski hair. But presumably not all the profit comes from the skiing itself. After people have had a ski, they want to enjoy the leisure facilities. Yes, that um, is probably the best management. And every uh, ski resort or ski centre should have uh, especially a bar and uh, a leisure centre to go with it. So we can do other things. We here only ski and it's very difficult to make ends meet if you only ski. There's, there's many things, in fact, that, that can be done to the existing slopes, um, especially in view of the fact that when many of them were developed uh, 10, 15 years ago, they probably weren't developed by people who, who were as well in, as informed as people are at present. Um, so things, for example, the uplift can be uh, put in or at least modified and improved so it moves more, more skiers per hour. Uh, then the slope can be developed and modified. Uh, stone drainage can be put into the slope to ensure proper drainage of water. Um, high quality underlay can be put on top of that to in, in order that there's no erosion of the soil underneath. And then a mat can be laid on top of that. 
that really improves the skiing performance of the material which in turn provides a better service to the skiers. It's a move towards providing bar and restaurant facilities, providing showering facilities, changing areas, uh, the most up-to-date equipment, uh, with a lot of attention being paid to safety. Until now, the majority of artificial ski slopes have been provided by local authorities, but in the future, private enterprise is more likely to fund new developments. Gordon Williamson is hoping to site a slope on this hillside at Loch Winnoch. Obviously, the, the, the skiing element has got to pay for itself. The infrastructure of that has got to make itself pay. And then thereafter, the money that would support the people employed in the system would be from restaurant roundabout, from the, these other, possibly pony trekking as a, a use of labour in the summertime when the ski slopes aren't as busy. So it, it's a, a total sort of leisure facility we want to provide eventually which would encompass as much as possible and possibly tie in with the regional park, giving them access for hill walkers and the likes. Now that we've done the, the basic groundwork, we would need to go and look at a, a full-blown feasibility study to make sure that the, the potential of the site is correct, the numbers of skiers in the area are there to justify it, and that there would be a return and obviously a big investment. So. I, in the next month or two, we'll probably set sail on that and get a, a full-blown feasibility study done, which at the end of the day we would have to do anyway if we're looking for funding from, from outside, which we will need. <laughs> Can the Scottish Sports Council provide technical support and advice for someone like Gordon Williamson to ensure the needs of both business and sport are met successfully? It certainly can, Sally. First of all, it can give advice on the necessity to carry out a full feasibility study to establish the size and segmentation of the market to make sure that the slope is directed either at the beginner, at the intermediate or the advanced skier. It also can ensure that the potential developer prepares a financial business plan to ensure that the return on the capital invested will be met and that there will be an operating profit. And what kind of capital costs are we talking about? It is difficult to give a precise set of capital costs because the size and specification of slopes vary. But let us establish a minimum standard. Let us say we're talking about a slope of 120 metres long by 15 metres wide, which has got flood lighting and uplift capacity. We'd be talking of an order of costs of a quarter of a million pounds. What key advice would you give to someone thinking of providing an artificial slope? Do your homework well. Make sure that you have carried out a marketing feasibility study and make sure that you have prepared a financial business plan. If all of that stacks up, design the slope to a high specification, ensure that it is constructed well and thereafter promote it exhaustively and manage it well. For copies of the Scottish Sports Council's Information Digest on Artificial Ski Slopes and for further information, contact the Scottish Sports Council at Caledonia House, South Gyle, Edinburgh, EH12 9DQ.